My name is uh, Jeff Rodewald. I'm with Aspen Dairy Solutions. And I uh, would like to welcome you to the 2011 World Dairy Expo. Today's seminar, Improve Your Smack Cell Count, 400,000 Beat It, is sponsored by Aspen Dairy Solutions. Aspen Dairy Solutions, our mission is to help protect the world food supply and overall food quality. We do this by helping producers harvest higher quantities of higher quality milk. And uh, we're, we're honored today to be able to, to uh, sponsor this seminar. Our speaker today is Dr. Yente Shuken, Professor and Director of Quality Milk Production Services at Cornell University. Dr. Shuken is a professor in the Department of Population Medicine and Diagnostic Sciences at the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell. His research focuses on population dynamics of infectious diseases, utter health, and statistical and mathematical models for animal disease research. Dr. Shuken has been honored with the Outstanding Scientist Award in 2002 by the American Dairy Science Association. Today's seminar has been approved for continuing education credits from uh, both the American Registry of uh, Professional Animal Scientists and the American Association of Veterinary State Boards, the RACE program. So forms are available in the back if you're interested in the RACE credits. So at this time, uh, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Shuken. Introduction and for the sponsoring. Um, Uh, in the next uh, hour or so, I'd like to uh, discuss with you the 400,000 Beat It program. Um, you'll see there's a lot of stuff you've probably seen before, but there is some new things as well, some new developments uh, in milk quality and particularly in management of milk quality. Um, I, I think that's becoming important, you know, with the world moving towards the 400,000 limit. Um, the U.S. was, you know, one vote away from also implementing the 400,000 limit, uh, and I think, uh, I, I suspect, I guess, uh, at some point in time in the near future, we'll also be at the, uh, at the limit of 400,000. So everybody uh, in, in the U.S. for sure uh, will have to deal with that uh, in, the, in, the nec in, the next, uh, in the next little while, in the near future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cells and how they work and why we have them and, and, and you know, are they good or are they bad and that sort of thing, and then talk a little bit about a program how to uh, improve the somatic cell count. Um, I think the group is nice, and, and, and uh, certainly if you want to stop me at any point in time and ask questions, I think that's just as useful as me doing a lot of talking. We, we certainly have time at the end for discussion, but if you want to know a little bit more about something, just raise your hand and, and we can do that as well. So the, um, the cell counts is the, is the number that we use, the 400,000, that's the cell counts that we use. Um, it's certainly not the only quality criteria. There's lots of other quality criteria that you could use uh, and that might be better or, or you could debate whether they're better or not. Um, but the reality is everybody uses cell count. So we might as well stick with that one for now and, and just accept it as the best measure or, or the only measure that we currently use for the other health quality of, uh, of dairy cows. Uh, and certainly it's used throughout the world uh, as the main quality criterion. What is cells? Um, cells uh, are in milk and they are supposed to be in milk. A cow cannot live without cells. I'll show you in a minute what the function is of these cells. Uh, and in a healthy cow, in a normal milk, in a healthy cow, most of these um, are, are white blood cells and the vast majority of those what we call macrophages. They're sort of the, the guardians of the system. They walk around in the mammary gland, they go around in the mammary gland, they actually go in and out, they, they can go both ways. Um, and as soon as they see something that they don't like, they raise an alarm. They have sort of a set of bells and whistles associated with them. And as soon as they see a bacterium or they see something else they don't like, they, they go at it uh, and they start uh, raising, raising, raising alarms. Um, and, and when that happens, um, then uh, you get mastitis milk, abnormal milk, then we get even more white blood cells. And the vast majority of those are sort of the soldiers, the neutrophils, they are the soldiers, they are coming in to actually do the killing and removing of the, of the bugs and all the nasty material. So it's, it's the guardians that are there always and we can't live without them. If we didn't have them, we would have a big issue. 
um, and it's the soldiers, the killers, uh, that, that in high cell count cows are the predominant uh, cells that we see in, in, uh, in the milk. And then we also have some, say, sloughing of the epithelial lining of the mammary gland, the cells that make the milk. Um, and they are normally there, and they just slough in a certain percentage. And so in low cell count milk, they form part of the somatic cell count. Um, when the cell count gets very high, then you know, they, there is still the, still the same sloughing, but they, they're just a very small proportion of what's left. So this, what, this is what's happening. This is a, a quarter. That's the teeth. These are bacteria here. And for some reason, through the teeth end, they might come in you know, during milking, between milkings, whatever the reason is. Uh, and then the, the macrophages, these black guardians here, these, these black dots here, they recognize the bacteria. Um, and they are now uh, raising these, um, these, these alarm signals. And they actually produce alarm signals, li little chemical substances. And they shoot those into the uh, circulation of the cow. And that signals the, um, the white blood cells in the, in the bloodstream these white blood cells, the neutrophils in the bloodstream, to come to the location where that infection is happening. So they, they signal and they tell the cow, okay, something is happening in my left front quarter, come here. And they come in large quantities, they fly into the quarter in large quantities, and they will, as soon as they pop out, they'll identify the location where these uh, bugs are sitting, the little yellow dots are sitting, and they are going to uh, kill them. So that's what we see here. This is um, the bloodstream. This is an artery. This is a vein. And this is the, the mammary gland. And the blood is flowing like crazy by here. But there is a small portion of cells, as you can see here, that are sitting on the inside of a vein that have gotten the signals uh, that something is happening in the mammary gland. So now they um, express uh, uh, molecules. It's like Velcro, so the, the side of the epithelial of the blood vessels, they express one side of the Velcro. The cells here express it on the other side, and they sort of connect. And instead of flying by, like you see all these things happening, and they'll pinch the vein in a minute, and then you'll see that there is a lot of cells in there. But then they are connected by Velcro, and then they go in between the lining cells of the blood vessel, and then they go to the site of the infection. So now they pinch the vein, and you can see this, the, the veins and the things are full of cells, mostly red blood cells, but also other cells. And only a few of those, these neutrophils, they're attaching using this Velcro system, and then eventually go to the area uh, where the infection is happening. So this is a very um, smart system, a very effective system, based on the signaling of these macrophages, these alarm bells that are ringing, and they say, okay, guys, the, the, the soldiers come here, and help me kill these, uh, these bugs. So these are the soldiers. These are the neutrophils. These are the guys that swim around in the blood vessels. And they, they get called in as soon as there is an issue. And you can see they have these tentacles, which in a three-dimensional picture are actually flaps. And they're, they're not tentacles, but they're like flaps. And those flaps will close around the bacterium and then actually start eating away at the bacterium, starting to kill the bacterium and uh, remove them from the milk. So these are the soldiers. This is a picture. This is actually a bug that's coming in, or a, an E. coli bug. This is an, uh, the soldier, the neutrophil coming in. And you'll see it, it starts to close its arms around it. The flaps are going around it. It's including it now. Then it, then it swallows it. And now it's sitting in a vacuole. And then it starts to, to spit all sorts of nasty stuff into this vacuole. It's oxidizing, actually, the bacteria, which is sort of rusting it away. It's trying to kill it. It gets darker and darker. There is no life anymore in the bacterium. And then eventually it'll spit it out and, uh, and get rid of the whole thing. As you can see, it goes now to the side. And it's connecting again. And then choo, it spits out whatever is left of the bacterium. This, this one, this, this soldier, actually has a tail. See that? So it's actually actively chasing after these bacteria that are in the milk. Uh, it, it recognizes the, the bacteria. And it actually chases after them and then tries to eat them. So it, it means um, that this is a very, very normal process. Um, if, we, if we have an infection, this is an infection in the mammary gland with, uh, with E. coli. Okay? So the cell count is low. This is the somatic cell count. Cell count is low. We have an infection. And then the cells go up. And that's exactly what I showed you in the video. It goes through this chemical alarm. So the cells are going there. They go to the gland. They start eating away at the bacteria. They kill them. 
Uh, and if things are successful, like they are here, then in about 10 or 14 days or so, uh, the cells are going down. They have eliminated all the issues. There is no problem anymore. And the cells are, are back to normal. This is exactly the same process that you have if you get a cut in your finger or so. Okay? If you get a cut in your finger, it's starting to swell. It's getting red. It's, 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 it's pulsing a little bit. Uh, eventually, you know, all those, um, all those bugs and cells are killed. You get a little bit of a pus thing on top of it. Um, and that's the same process. The, the cells are going there to kill, remove, and eventually it scabs off, and the whole thing is, uh, is completed again. Well, that's, that's a, a normal process, and we wouldn't really live without it, right, because we might have all sorts of nasty infections. The only thing is, of course, it, it's during this time, the cow is still producing milk, um, so we need to have systems to remove that milk from the, the pipeline that brings it to the consumers. Okay, so recognition of mastitis is the key part. It's not so much that these cows are abnormal. They're actually doing very well. It's a very normal thing that they do it, and we just need to help that cow to live through that uh, week or so uh, with high somatic cell counts. So cells are our friends, um, and, and they absolutely are. There is no life without uh, in, inflammatory cells. The cow couldn't live without cells, and... And just like, uh, just like us, we couldn't live without cells. Um, that means we have to be a little bit careful. Eh? And the question often comes up, uh, can cells get too low? Can we have too few cells? If we just continue to be clean and we breed better cows and you know, all that sort of stuff, will we eventually go to a system with zero cells in the milk? And is that an issue? Well, the answer is yes. Theoretically, you can. Um, We've done quite a bit of research in that area. And if your cell count is like 10,000 or 5,000, which shows up on your DHIA form as 5 or so, or 2, uh, those cows have a little bit higher risk of getting mastitis. So on the extreme side of very few cells, um, you can have an issue. Uh, for those of you that remember this, we used to have these blad cows, like bovine leukocyte adhesion deficiency cows. Those cows were not able to bring the soldiers to the gland. They, they were, there was alarm bells enough, uh, but the, the bacteria didn't have the Velcro, or the cells didn't have the Velcro. The Velcro was broken, genetically broken, so all these soldiers were flying around like crazy, but they never got to the gland. So that, that was not a good situation. Those cows had lots of inflammations and nasty stuff. Um, so we don't want to have a situation with zero cells. Well, I looked at the data, uh, and these are all bulk tanks, um, from Ontario. That's the data set that I had available for, for a number of years, all the bulk tanks in Ontario. So if you look at the bulk tanks in Ontario, um, there is a few. There's about 1.1% uh, 1 .1 of farms that have a cell count in the 20,000 range that you might say there's probably a bunch of cows there that would be at risk. It also means 99.9% .9 of farms have cell counts where the big problem is that they have too high a cell count and they absolutely have no issue with too low of a cell count. So the real answer is no, not really. It's virtually impossible to have too low cell counts. There might be a very, very small minority, uh, but, but in all cases, almost all farms can improve their cell count without putting their cows at risk. Um, so then what's a normal cell count? Eh, if, if five is a little bit low, what's the normal cell count? If we look at healthy animals, um, the cell count of healthy animals, this is uh, the red line, is the first lactation, um, second lactation, and third lactation. The, the cell count is about 50,000. And it tends to go up and down a little bit with milk production. And you can see it's almost a, the inverse of the lactation curve. So if lactation drops at the end of lactation, cell count will go up a little bit. There's probably a little bit of a dilution effect. Very high producing cows, older cows at peak of milk production, 100 to 150 days have a little bit lower cell count. But somewhere in that 50,000 range, that's what, you, uh, or that's what a normal cow looks like. These were all cows where we were absolutely certain they had no mastitis and they had no infection. And we measured them on a continuous basis, and that's where we got these data from. We also know that cows vary a little bit in the cell count. So even though we know the average is about 50,000, that's typically not what we call the cutoff for normal and abnormal. So the cutoff for normal and abnormal is what we have here. 95% of the healthy cows are below the cutoff here. And this is the cutoff for um, second lactation and third lactation cows. And as you can see, again, it's the inverse of the milk production curve. If you flip it over, you get a milk production curve. Um, 
And then, uh, particularly if the production dro drops towards the end of lactation, you know, most cows are still below 200,000. So in most situations, we use 200,000 for a uh, practical purpose as a cutoff for a cow that's normal and a cow that's not normal. If the cow gets over 200,000, that's a cow that we want to look at and see if she has these um, issues with, with somatic cell count. You can also see that you might want to do that for first lactation animals at about 100,000. Okay? Almost always, first lactation cows, 95% of the time, they are below 100,000. Maybe the only exception is the first cell count after calving, uh, but otherwise, first lactation animals really should be below 100,000. So for us in the U.S., that means we typically use a uh, cutoff of a linear score of four for second and older lactation animals to say that's normal or that's not normal, and we use a linear score of three for first lactation animals to say she's normal or she's, she's not normal. So that's what these data are based on, um, and that's, I think, very useful to look at, at dynamics of cells and how they move uh, and how things happen uh, on the farm. So that's why we use the, the cutoff. This is the cutoff of 200,000, the linear score of four is what I have here. So this is the last month, so a month ago cell count. This is the most recent cell count, so like yesterday cell count. Um, and if we plot those like we have them here, then these cows were below 200,000 here, and they're below 100,000 here. So that's where we want all our cows to be, right, or as much as possible to be, so in, in the low cell count area. If they used to be low last time and now they're high, then we have new cases. And this cow used to have a cell count of three and now it has a cell count of six and a half, so she's a new infection. And we may want to follow her and see what's happening. She could be one of those completely normal animals that just goes up and down again and just behaves like she should behave. Or she might be a cow that eventually becomes chronic, where the cell count last month was high and this month it's high again. So she is. Uh, multiple times high, so this, 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 this quick up and down didn't work with her, and the, the bugs probably had smarter mechanisms uh, to keep uh, the infection and keep the cell count high. So for our purposes, in terms of dealing with somatic cell counts, we're looking at new cases to see what the risk is for cows in the farm in terms of getting an infection, and if your milking procedures are not top-notch, then you have more new infections. If your housing is not top-notch, you have more new infections. But to deal with the cell count, uh, we're particularly interested in the chronics, because the new ones might be very healthy animals that just get an infection and show this up-and-down pattern uh, that they are able to deal with all by themselves. For, for the chronics, that's not the case. They show an issue over time that they are not able to resolve the infection. So the, um, the, uh, the, the cell count issue, as you know, uh, the 400,000 issue, as you know, is because most countries uh, have cell count limits of 400,000. And the important milk makers in the world, the European Union, um, New Zealand, the 95% of their milk goes for export, so they have a big part in the uh, export situation. Um, uh, Australia, same thing, a lot of export. Canada, up until now, is, is at 500,000, but as of Next year, they switch to 400,000. So you can see the U.S. is sticking out a little bit as a sore thumb in this list here. Uh, we still have our cutoff limit at 750,000. Um, and, and again, we were very, very close to also uh, going with the world, uh, uh, with the world um, market, so to say, to get to the 400,000 limit. And I suspect at some point we'll, we'll go there as well. The good thing is, if we look at our data, this is data that, that I, uh, I got from the USDA. They follow the cell counts of a lot of farms. It's, it's uh, four, four of the ten milk marketing orders, but it's about 50% of the milk that we have data from that, that collect cell count data on a regular basis uh, and make it available. If you look at that data, then the story in the U.S. is actually quite nice. Um, and this is 2009. That's the most recent data that we have. Uh, about 10 years ago, our cell count was about 320 or so, uh, and it's been going down ever since. It's, it's now at approximately 230. This is the DHIA data, so the average of the individual cell counts of cows. This is the uh, milk plant data in those four federal milk orders. So actually, the story in the U.S., there is no reason really why we shouldn't be uh, joining the 400,000 
countries because we're doing actually quite well. Our cell count is not that big of an issue, uh, um, at least on average. It doesn't mean that individual farms don't have an issue. Uh, this is the same data. Um, this is the uh, amount of milk that is less than 100, less than 200, less than 400, etc. This is the number of shipments, so bulk tanks that are going out. And this is the number of producers that have um, always sells below 100,000. And as you can see, if we use the 400,000 cutoff, then 89 uh, billion pounds of milk is less than 400,000. That's quite a bit. Eh? If you think about 100, million or 100 billion or so, so about 90% of our milk is less than 400,000. Um, but that's only 75% of shipments. Eh? So, so you can also say 25% of bulk tanks are still over 200,000. And also, 50% is under 400,000 on a continuous basis. That means that 50% of the farms, at least once a year, have a cell count over 400,000. Doesn't mean you get immediately a penalty, but certainly, if you want to have good milk and, and not have an issue with penalties, you need to beat the 400K, and, and about 50% of farms will need to work on that to make sure that they always beat uh, the 400K. So even though our cell count actually is going nice, down quite nicely, um, we still have work to do uh, if we were to implement the, uh, the, the lower cell count limit. We're not the only one, also countries that do have the 400,000 limit, sorry, have, have work to do. This is the New Zealand data, you know, an, an, an intense competitor for us on the world market. Uh, and certainly their cell count has gone up in the last few years. So they went down quite nicely, uh, and now it's creeping up again. Uh, Ontario, their cell count has gone down over the years, but now it's creeping up again. And for them, a reason to say we really need to implement uh, the 400,000 limit. Um, so, so it needs continuous uh, uh, watching, it needs continuous action to maintain the cell count uh, below 400,000. So to do that, we developed together with the Dairy Herd Improvement Organization in the Northeast uh, a program that we call the 400K Beat It program. And it's sort of a, a six-month intense uh, collaboration between the DHIA organization, between the cooperative that buys the milk, between the farm and the veterinarian and whoever else is involved in milk quality. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through that program with you and I'll, uh, I'll show uh, some, some of the steps involved. So the first step, in the first month we do a management survey uh, and I'll show you that in a minute. We, we went through the literature and say, okay, these are the known factors that are associated uh, with other health problems. And then we score the farm and we, we give them a report card and say these are the good pieces and these are the not so good pieces that you need to work on. Then the second thing is we do a bulk tank test uh, just to see what major bacteria are present. Do you have a Staph aureus issue? Might there even be some Strep Ag involved? Is there a lot of Streptococci problems? Uh, maybe even Mycoplasma in some cases. So we have a bit of a rough idea what sort of bugs are present. Um, then there is three months of intense uh, somatic cell count sampling and based on the high cell count cows uh, uh, cultures to see what individual cows have for issues and we analyze that data and report back to the farm about the key problems that we identify and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. And then there is a um, follow-up meeting, follow-up uh, team meeting to say, okay, these are the key issues to work on, that's what you have to implement, these are the deadlines and that's what we continue to do. The first step usually is to calculate some uh, costs of the whole thing because it's, it's not only the goal of having good milk, which I think is a very good goal, but there is usually also quite a bit of money involved. Uh, and we know there is a direct relationship between milk production loss and the somatic cell count. So the higher the cell count, the more milk uh, the cow is losing. Um, so we developed a spreadsheet. This is a spreadsheet that we adapted from uh, John Fetro, but specifically for this purpose. Uh, and it has a very strong focus on uh, the eventual loss of money. And in our system, in the U.S. system, uh, it typically means that we have uh, loss because of extra culling. Uh, we have loss because of too many cases of clinical mastitis. We have milk production loss. And then quite often we have uh, a lot of money involved in premiums. So if your cell count is 400,000 and you can bring it down to, let's say, less than 250, in a lot of co-ops, that means you get an extra 25 cents or even 50 cents or even more uh, for your milk. 
or if your cell count is at 200 and you can bring it below 150, you get an extra 20 cents um, for your milk. So the, um, the way that it works, this is a spreadsheet that is behind it. So you enter the data for every farm. Um, and I think the, the good thing about this particular spreadsheet is um, that it, um, it, it sets the goals for a dairy. So we're not assuming that 0% mastitis is realistic, right? That's not a, a realistic situation. 1% may be realistic or 2%. So we're looking at the current situation and then say, what's the goal? What do you want to go for? Uh, and then, uh, and then and calculate the difference. This is a farm. It's about a 450 um, cow dairy um, who has a current cell count of um, uh, about about 170. So the average cell count currently is 170. And their goal is to have a cell count of 140, because that means that they capture the extra premium at the cutoff of 150,000. So even though they don't have a ton of an issue, uh, 170 is quite nice, uh, they, they don't get everything. There is 25 cents to be gotten per, per 100 pounds of milk, per 50 kilos of milk, uh, if they improve their milk quality to less than 150. And that on this farm, on this 500 cow dairy, that's about 42,000 in premiums. It's about 22,000 in less culling. And there's about 5,000 or 6,000 or so to be gained in less clinical cases. So even in those farms with a very high quality, uh, there is still money to be made from, uh, from improving the, uh, the somatic cell count. So this is the the general flow that we use, uh, 400K beaded program. First, we try to find some short-term solutions, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, then we develop some realistic goals, analyze the underlying problem using a risk assessment, summarize and prioritize, and then continue to monitor and, and do surveillance. So what are some, what are some um, uh, short-term solutions? Well, one might be to look at the bulk tank and bacteria counts and see if there is anything specific happening, if there's a bunch of Staph aureus cows or Mycoplasma cows, a problem. Then you can identify these uh, high cell count cows, um, look at their uh, cell count on DHI, do a, do a CMT test, uh, and then, then s uh, send the samples for culture and then make decisions on those individual cows. Okay? Quarter milking, uh, taking a cow out, putting cow uh, just for pasteurized milk for the, for the calves, uh, culling cows, drying off cows, drying off quarters. Uh, in, in, uh, in quite a number of cases, uh, decisions on a few cows uh, will have quite an impact on the somatic cell count. It may not change the underlying problems, but it certainly will drop the bulk tank somatic cell count uh, quite quickly. Um, then the second step is to develop realistic goals. And now we have make, maybe taken the sting out of it a little bit, but we still want to improve and make realistic goals. Yeah, the question is whether we want one sample or multiple samples. Um, and I think it's good to have multiple samples. Um, some cows are not shedding every day, so if you're interested in some of these organisms like Staph aureus or Mycoplasma, it may be good to take three consecutive bulk tank samples. Yeah. So then you develop goals. What's realistic uh, based on the bulk tank? We, we can look at new infection risk. I'll show you that in a minute. And then typically the best success goes if you work with a team, a milk quality team, uh, where other people are involved and looking a little bit over your shoulder and helping uh, implement the goals that we uh, that you decided on. Then the next step is to perform a uh, risk assessment to to go after the actual uh, reasons that the cell count is high. And we can start culling cows and drying off cows, but if continuously we have new cows coming in with high cell count, we're not really solving the the key issue. We're just going after the symptoms of the problem, so to say. And so the the uh, risk assessment is a good thing to do um, and, then, um, and then identify what's the problem. Is it just a few animals? Is it a lot of new infections? Is it a lot of chronics? Is it a lot of fresh cows? Or some sort of combination of the, of the above issues. And this is the flow chart that we use for evaluating somatic cell count. And there's a lot of stuff here. So this is maybe more than um, what you like 
Some of it is focused on lactating cow issues. Some of it is focused on dry cow issues. Um, and I'll, I'll show you just a simple version. This is a lot easier to look at. Um, so if we have a high cell count, the first step is, do we have a few cows that do it, or do we have a lot of cows that do it? If it is just a few cows, then you focus on those cows and say, okay, let's identify them. Let's CMT the quarters. Let's see what sort of bugs are involved. Uh, is it a cow that we can treat? Is it somebody that we can dry off or, or cull or remove from the farm and, and deal with those few animals? If it is more than a few animals, there is mostly three main areas of concern. One is a lot of new infections. One is a lot of chronic infections. And one is a lot of fresh cow infections. These two are typically lactating cow issues, and this is obviously a fresh cow and most often a dry cow issue. And for a cow to have a new infection, she has to have a low cell count to start with. So she came into lactation and she was healthy at some point in time, and then her cell count went up. So that's a new infection. Um, a chronic infection means she's, she's held multiple high cell counts now, and for some reason she's not curing. And fresh cows means a lot of cows are coming out of the dry period with, with very high somatic cell count. So most likely they got those during the dry period. This is an example of a farm. Um, they're milking 158 cows. Uh, their current cell count is 413. Um, and as you can see, these are the cow IDs, the individual cows. This is their milk production in, in pounds, so divide by two for, for kilos. Uh, and this is their cell count. And if you multiply their production by the cell count and divide it by all the cows in the farm, then this cow is producing 18% of the tank, and the, these two, 18 and 12, producing about 30% of the cell counts uh, in the bulk tank. So here, you could say, hey, if we make it even three cows, three cows are doing 40% of the cells in the bulk tank. So we might as well say here, let's focus first on those animals and see what's the reason there and what's behind those, and is that specific issues, um, and then uh, see if we remove those or deal with those if there is still underlying issues. And by removing a few animals, um, you know, you can go from 400,000, over 400,000 to 200,000 by just looking at a few animals and trying to deal with those. So certainly there is opportunities, and this is true in virtually all farms and virtually all size farms. Obviously in a big dairy, if you have 2,000 cows, it's probably not one cow, but it may be a few cows that are doing exactly the same, that a few cows are causing... 20, 30, 40% of the cells. And the reason is that these cells are so crazy, crazy high. Hey, if normal is 50, you can see this cow uh, with, with over a million. Hey, if normal is 50, this one is, is producing cells for 200 cows. So you only need a few of those animals, even in a 2,000 cow dairy, to get an enormously doubling or hey, a higher, higher somatic cell count. So in every farm, the identification of do we have a few cow issue or do we have a farm issue is a key step uh, to make. By looking at the cell count dynamics over time, um, we can identify if there is specific problems. Okay, so these are the chronic infections, these are the new infections, these are the high fresh cows, and in this particular dairy, the, the, the cows calving with high somatic cell count, it used to be 15, 16, etc., but currently, we're running at about 30% cows. So they more than doubled the new infections coming out of the dry period. And subsequently, you can see that resulted in a lot of cows that had chronic infections. And it used to be 7, 8, but now they're up to 10, 12, 13, even up to 16. So we have, if we graph it out, we have an increase in the fresh cow infections. And that, with a little bit of a delay, results in much more uh, chronically high infections. Okay, so clearly the cause here is the, is the fresh cow infections, and we need to look, for example, in the dry period, uh, what might be the key reason that we have so many fresh cow infections. So that's analyzing the data, and by looking at the data, you often get a very good idea what's happening, what, what are the key areas of concern. Uh, then you can perform a, a risk assessment. So it's a questionnaire, it's observation, it's measurements, and these are the key areas to identify. Uh, biosecurity, what do we happen if we buy a cow? Do we check her? What is our culling policy? Eh? Are cows in and out? Milking procedures, milking equipment, treatment protocols, hygiene, and uh, this is sort of the immune response of the cow, nutrition, genetics, uh, those sort of things. And we identified um, 
key areas. We went through the literature and said these are the known issues and this is what we need to know from the farm uh, to identify the, the key risk profile. And so this is the general information. We do a lot of work on the farm and then we say your other health score is about 70 out of a maximum of 100. So even though your cell count is not so bad, this is the same farm with the cell count as 170, there is still uh, about 20% uh, uh, opportunity for improvement. There is still areas where you're not so very strong. And you can um, zoom into that, of course. You'd like to know what the issue is. Uh, so this is the, the overall information. And we ask questions about biosecurity. Is it a closed herd? No, it's not a closed herd. Do you examine animals on arrival? No. Are they tested for mycoplasma? No. Are they tested at calving? They do. They do a CMT at calving. Um, do you have a culling policy in place? Yes. And then there is sort of a score. Do you implement those policies carefully? And they, they don't really do it so carefully. So this is not a very strong area in the farm. Uh, if you had a different farm that, that actually was doing all this, they were closed, they were testing animals um, if anything was brought in. Um, and you can see the, the score improves. And the thing gets slower and slower and slower, gets more and more green. They not only have the policies, but they also implement them well. And now we have a farm that has excellent uh, biosecurity uh, profile. And we do this for all these components. And in the end, there is sort of a final score uh, that tells us what the good parts and the bad parts are of the farm management. And so biosecurity, I just artificially now improved that. That was actually low, and that was a red area. Milking procedures are pretty good. The milking system uh, is not so good. There is a lot of loose ends there. They don't have a regular uh, checkup system. They don't have uh, standard operating procedures to evaluate uh, uh, vacuum. Uh, they don't test their pulsators on a continuous basis. So there is a lot of loose ends there that might be risky uh, for the farm. Treatment protocols, 70% score. It's okay, but certainly could improve a little bit. Um, the housing, particularly the housing, you can't see that here, particularly the housing of young stock was a problem on this farm. So they, they do okay, but certainly not super. Uh, nutrition was excellent. They did lots of good things in terms of selenium and vitamin E. And overall, that's the 74% that I showed you in the beginning. That's the score of the farm. And, uh, and here you show the same thing, but just in a, in a bar graph. So this identifies, based on, I think it's about 70 questions or so, what the, what the key points are, the, the weak points in management uh, in terms of the other health situation on the farm. So some of that is, is milking routine evaluation. Here we're scoring uh, attachment time and stripping time and that sort of thing, how, how good things are going. Um, we're looking at the milk flow using the lactocorder, so uh, you get a very precise score of, of, of measurement of the milk flow. And this is clearly a cow with a bimodal milk flow. And uh, there is a little bit of milk coming first, then the claw is dr dry again, there is no milk coming, and then the rest of the milk comes out, which means there is about a minute or so of over-milking at the beginning of the milking process. And the cow is milking dry for about a minute, and then the milk starts flowing. Well, if, if you don't like bad tea dents, that's not the way to go and you probably want to improve that. Same in this cow, we see this bimodal milk flow. There's about a minute and a half of sort of blind milking at the beginning. But also here, there is an issue with the takeoff. And the, the milk flow is very low at the end, uh, and there may be an issue with the takeoff. So by having these data, that information, you get a very precise idea what's happening uh, with the milking process. Uh, uh, issues, yeah. And then the is up. Bad T-dens are, are at higher risk for infection. And the, the unit on time is the biggest risk factor for uh, T-dent, you know, the T-dent eversions, the, the lesions and the rings at the end of the teeth. But, but again, there is two components here. There is blind milking here, and there is blind milking here on both sides of the milking process. And the actual milking process is only about three minutes or so. And but the unit is on for about six and a half minutes. It most uh, this is one farm, um, so this is a manual mode issue. Yeah, yeah. And the reason actually on this farm that it's manual mode is because the takeoff was 
hitting in here, right? The takeoff was activated at the beginning of milking, and he said, oh, the machine is so bad. No, it, the takeoff is fine, but there is no milk. So it, it correctly sees there is no milk, and it starts to retract the unit from the, uh, from the, from the cow. We do T-dense scoring systems, cow hygiene. Obviously, these cows are at much higher risk for uh, infections. Uh, T-dense swabbing before the unit gets on. If there's a lot of cows in this area, obviously, those cows have a much higher risk of uh, environmental-type infections. Um, and then the, the T-dense lesions, as we discussed. Eh? So these ones with rings, especially with rough rings, uh, they are at higher risk of getting new infections. And we obviously don't want to have too many of these. With most of these systems, uh, we use an 80-20 rule. We would like to have 80% of cows in score 1 and 2. Same here, 1 and 2. Same here, 1 and 2. So 80% of cows are low. 20, you, you know, you're going to have some variation. Uh, so it's the 80-20 rule that, that, is, uh, that, that makes the risk or, or not the risk. Obviously, equipment testing is an important one. Uh, this is a uh, pulsation curve, as you can see. And there clearly is an issue here. Um, with the C phase and virtually no D phase. Any idea what this might be? Sorry? Pulsator. Pulsator problem, yeah. And this is probably the most frequent issue in pulsators. It's dirt. Uh, so this is an air inlet in the stall, or, and there is not a clean airline. There's an air inlet in the stall. There's a lot of dirt getting in. And the closure uh, or the opening of the air line doesn't function very well. And there is a difficulty getting clean air in. Uh, so you get a very slow C phase and virtually no D phase. Obviously, this is a risk factor for uh, T dent uh, congestion. So then the final other health score, as I showed you before, um, gives a bit of an overview of the weak and the strong sides of the dairy. Okay, so we've gone through this. We've analyzed the data. We've done a risk analysis. And now we say, OK, let's, let's focus on things like biosecurity issues, uh, milking system, and probably uh, housing is the next one to look at. And those are the things you want to improve on, you want to work on to uh, further improve the uh, somatic cell count. So then the end, uh, 400K beat it. Uh, we have collected all that data. We know all, all of what's happening on the farm. Um, and now we're. Um, Summar summarizing the problems and prioritizing the solutions. Okay, so based on this chart, we say this is probably the first thing to work on. We want to implement some biosecurity issues. We want to make sure if we get animals in that we test them. Uh, we want to have good culling protocols in place. Cows that, that have more than three or four times mastitis really should be on the do not breed list and on the cull list. Um, and we need, we need to implement those policies. Uh, there is issues with the milking system. Uh, hygiene of the pulsators, uh, regular checking of the pulsators, protocols in place to make sure that they get evaluated on a regular basis. And then the next one uh, is probably the hygiene issue, particularly in this case, the hygiene of the, of the young stock, of the pre-calving uh, first lactation animals, pre-calving heifers. And with that, we should be able to um, improve the situation further. And those are the prevention programs based on the changes we implement. Prevention programs, there may be a treatment program, particularly farms with lots of chronic cows. We may pick and choose animals with, with long-term high somatic cell counts and implement treatment programs to deal with those infections. Depends a lot on the type of organisms you have on the farm. Uh, if there is a lot of streptococcal type organisms, that's probably a good way to go or an easier way to go. Um, with Staphylococcus aureus, particularly, that's not an easy one. Um, quarter milking, as shown here, um, certainly is a short-term issue. Uh, you can remove the extreme high somatic cell counts and get that into a completely different milking system. Uh, and of course, culling, whether it's culling of the quarters or culling of the cows, uh, is, is part of, the, uh, is part of the, the process as well. And then... Um, all these things are, are based on um, the usual, and there is, there is not too complex issues here, the usual um, uh, advice or the usual 10-point program from the National Mastitis Council that's here. And we split it in five green issues and five blue issues. So, so blue is sort of the, the management part, uh, the blue color type thing. Um, and, and that's about establishing goals, record keeping, biosecurity, so decision making about culling and buying cows, monitoring, 
review. These are sort of the management components. And these are the green fingers. The green five are sort of the worker components. That's elbow grease. You need to do that on the farm. You actually have to work. So the clean environments, the milking procedures, the maintenance of the equipment to test the pulsators, etc. Clinical mastitis treatment, segregation, all that sort of thing. And then the management of the dry cow, so cleaning of the bedding and all that sort of thing. And so there is five and five. The manager is important, obviously, and the people uh, that, that do the work um, uh, are, are key for making, uh, making it successful. Then the final step is surveillance. Even if you're successful or if you're successful in lowering the somatic cell count, you obviously want to make sure that that continues. Um, so bulk tank surveillance, so many times a year, you test the bulk tank to see if there's any nasty stuff coming up. And if it comes up, that you catch it as soon as possible. Uh, evaluate your cell counts. New infections particularly is a very good one to follow to see if there's any lapse in uh, milking procedure or environmental hygiene. Uh, and then take individual cow samples and do culture where that is relevant uh, for knowing what's happening uh, with those cows. So that's the plan. If you want to beat 400K, you have to do something along these lines, I think. Um, first, the short-term issues, then say, what's realistic for my farm? What's the, what's the goal for cell count that I shoot at? What's the goal for new infections that I shoot at? Perform a risk assessment and get a, get a bit of a... Um, a score system in place, what's the good and what's the weak parts on my farm, uh, summarize, prioritize, and then if you're successful in the end, make sure you have a monitoring surveillance program in place. So if something goes wrong, you can immediately have an action and uh, improve the situation. So I think uh, if 400K comes here, and I'm sure it will, um, we can beat it. And the goal to shoot for, a realistic goal to shoot for, is to have cell counts between 50,000 and 200,000. This is almost the upper limit if you want to beat 400,000 because we know there is a lot of day-to-day -day variation. Okay? You just have to have one or two of those high cell count cows coming in and your cell count is suddenly 350. So if you want to beat 400, you should be shooting at about 200,000 or lower if you want to capture all the premiums that the uh, milk buyers are offering. Um, it's a very logical process. I took you to the steps. It's a six-step system. Uh, we have flow charts. We have risk assessments. We have all these things in place. It's really not so complicated to identify what's happening and what needs to be done. Um, but eventually, of course, to, to get there, to beat 400K, you need to have goals. What do I want? You need to have plans, and you need to have standard operating procedures in place so that things are actually happening. Okay, so you don't wait until something breaks. You have a regular monitoring system that makes sure that your equipment is working, that the protocols are happening, etc. So 400K beat it. It's absolutely doable. We, we can certainly do it. I don't see any issues at all uh, implementing it um, because we have the tools and the tricks and the, and the systems available uh, to make it happen. With that, I'm open for any questions and suggestions that you have. Uh, at the beginning, you chalk it up. Yeah. It took about 14 days for that cow to actually reduce the stomach cell count with the infections and the yeah. Is that normal what you see on the field that the lower stomach cell count is only in Ecoli? It's going to take about two weeks to lower the count? Yeah, so the question is we saw the graph on cell count, and it takes about 14 days from the cell counts to go up and then down again. Uh, for all the successful uh, infections, so where the, the process that I showed you with the cells flying in and the killing of the cells, for all successful resolution of infections, that's the normal process. It's the immediate growth, and then there is sort of a little bit of scab work uh, going on for a while, and it takes about 14 days to go back to normal. Not very different from any scab you have on your hand. It's exactly the same process. Dr. Blowy, good day. Hi. Two questions. One is the dry-off procedures and, and what is the success that you expect from dry-off, and the second is the bulk milk um, culture. 
if I follow cell counts by DHIA, so really I have cow cell counts, not, not, not quarter cell counts, what I like to see is that those animals that have high cell counts before calving, before dry off, that 80% of those have low cell count afterwards. Now I'm talking up about a quarter that do a dry off during lactation cycle. Oh, I see. So it's got a high cell count cow. You want to keep noting that dry off a quarter during lactation. I think I'm getting the that. Right. Um, yeah. So, so what's your procedure? Um, do you have a recommended procedure? It's essentially not milking anymore. I, I typically stay away from iodine or whatever other stuff. So just stop milking that quarter. Do you know, yeah. uh, uh, people who do that, what percentage of those quarters would come back into normal milk production in the next lactation with a low cell count? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't followed that up. I can't really say that. Yeah, yeah. And then the second question is, what bacteria are you interested in in the bulk tank? Obviously, the contagious ones, the um, Staph aureus, um, Mycoplasma, Streptococcus argalactiae, and we are very interested in the Streptococcus as well. So if we see Strep uberus and Strep discalactiae, we will specifically look at those. Because particularly the Streptococci, they can shed enormous amounts of bacteria. So one infected quarter can shed, you know, 100 million bacteria or so. So if we find those in a bulk tank, we will specifically look at those. The question is about prototheca mastitis. That's a very good question. Um, for some reason, in the last summer, we've seen quite a bit of prototheca. Um, it's it's like almost like mycoplasma. It's a very nasty organism. There is no treatment. Uh, it's an algae. Um, high risk is is watery areas, splashing, uh, flush barns. Um, but but once you have it, the risk of transmission in the farm is extremely high. Uh, Two areas. One is uh, is during milking, okay? cows shedding prototheca in the liners and infecting other cows that way, uh, and the other one is the sick pen, uh, because there is it's not susceptible to antibiotics. So if you get uh, something on your hands or or uh, even in uh, bottles of antibiotics, uh, you'll nicely transmit it from cow to cow, which is not really different than the mycoplasma. So you need to have very strict protocols for milking for identification of mastitis, uh, and for treatment uh, systems. Typically, they don't cure, um, so they, they probably have to go into a do-not-breed pen and eventually disappear from the farm. Yeah? <coughs> no, you, you can send me an email, and I can provide you that information. So the question is, what's the reason for increase in somatic cell count? Um, I, I think, I mean, we've seen the same in European data also. They, they, uh, they have gone up a little bit. I think it's a lot about uh, relative emphasis of farms and co-ops and milk buyers on uh, milk quality. So as soon as you start activating that, if they have a very, very uh, good communication programs about the importance of low cell count, I'm sure you'll see cell counts go down again. From your standpoint, <clears throat> why do you think, and I don't want to open up a can of worms, but why do you think USA is better than <laughs> The question is, uh, <laughs> the question is why the US didn't change to 400,000 and stayed with 750? Um, I know the reasons for individual voters in, in the... Uh, in the, in the meeting, um, I, I have to say, it, it's, it's quite disappointing. Uh, it's, it's been mostly, I think, the way that they wanted to implement it and some of the politics behind it. Uh, this time around, we had national milk producers very much in favor, uh, USDA very much in favor. Um, so I, I think there was, everything was there to make it successful, but the, the specific system that they wanted wasn't, wasn't the most attractive one. So my, my hope is that they'll deal with that the next time around that we'll, we'll, we'll vote. Yeah. And again, the data are very favorable. We can really do it. It's not a, it's not a big deal for most places. 
On behalf of Aspen Dairy Solutions and World Dairy Expo, I'd like to thank Dr. Shukin for his presentation. Thank you. I'm sure he will be around for a few minutes if you have additional sure. questions. Sure. I'd also like to introduce um, my colleagues that are with me today in the back. Uh, our milk quality specialist, Troy Holman, if, Troy, if you want to stand up, and Mark Dietrichs with Asthma Dairy Solutions. So if you have additional milk quality questions, you can ask those gentlemen as well. Additionally, I'd like to invite you uh, at 2 o'clock today in a few minutes upstairs in the, uh, the Wabasha room, Wabasha room is a, another presentation on uh, bacteria counts, how to increase your profitability. And uh, the focus of that presentation is on PI counts, uh, SPC, LPCs, so bacteria counts that are more in equipment and uh, sanitation. So I invite you to, to, to attend that seminar. Um, I hope that uh, everyone has enjoyed their visit to the 2011 World Dairy Expo. And uh, again, thank you for coming. Please fill out the evaluation forms and, and leave them in the back of the room. Thank you.